Hello everyone, we're getting ready to look up today with a brand new Uplook video with a very shocking top 10 list. You can like the video, subscribe, and ring the bell to make sure you don't miss out on any of our future videos. Today's topic looks at 10 objections to the gospel from John 3.16. You wonder how anyone could object to the gospel. It's a free gift. It's a one-size-fits-all, and it never wears out, and it only gets better. It makes you as rich as God is. It puts you on a career path towards the royal family. But object they do about everything that we see in this most famous sentence in the Bible. So let's start with our first objection. Number one, for God. Here's an objection. I completely object to that. People will say there's no proof that God exists. Or humanity believes in so many gods. Which one are you believing in? Or besides, who made God? If God made you, who made God? And these are all empty arguments. First of all, no proof that God exists. Romans chapter 1 says that God has clearly manifested himself to us. He has not given us overwhelming evidence because he wants us to choose to believe, but he's given us sufficient evidence to believe. And he says, you will find me if you seek for me with your whole heart. This whole idea of many gods, of course, we don't believe in manufactured gods. The one true God is the uncaused cause of the universe. And there's no idea that he was made who made God. Uh, believing in made gods is the heart of idolatry. So God has revealed himself. He's revealed himself as a God of love. And he manifests himself in many different ways. In history, in providence, in creation, in Christ, in fellow Christians, in the scriptures. There's lots of evidence. And God says, you will find me if you seek for me with your whole heart. So loved, number two. Now, you have to disagree with that. People will say, well, if there is a God, how can he be a God of love in a world like this? That's the number one argument that people raise in their objection. And yet, the problem is, if you don't accept a supreme God, a transcendent lawgiver, there's no basis by which you can speak about good and evil. Everything is simply preference. And when the Bible reveals that God does love the human race, that he loved the human race so much as to give his own son, uh, love is manifested everywhere. Every expression of love, true love, can be traced back to God. Love is of God because God is love. And so to reject a God of love is to step into a black hole, a hopeless, purposeless existence the idea that there's a real being behind the universe, once you reject that, it's nihilism for you. Number three, the world. I have to take an issue to that. <laughs> Even some Christians object to this idea. They say God only loved a certain group of people, the elect. But people say, what about the heathen? What about those who lived before the cross? Is there any hope for them? And this is where we have to read very carefully what the Word of God says, that the Holy Spirit went out into the world to convince the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And this is the light that lightens every man that comes into the world. And as we see from Romans 1, God is revealed to the whole world through the stars, through his creation. He has revealed his existence. And he pleads with men and women to seek after him and he promises to them that he that comes to God must believe that he is, and he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. If people are diligent in their search for God, he says, you will find me if you seek for me with all your heart. And so God, yes, he loves the world. He wants the world. And John tells us someday in heaven we'll see evidence for that when out of every kindred, tribe, tongue, people, and nation, there will be people saved by the grace of God. Number four, that he gave. Now, we got to challenge that one. 
And the reason is that people are offended that they can't contribute something to their own salvation. Salvation is a gift. God gave his son and he gives us eternal life. We can't pay for it. We can't earn it. We can't deserve it. And people strenuously object to this idea. And yet this is the message of the gospel. The gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, the wages of sin is death. That means we worked for it, we got it coming, we deserve it. But when it comes to salvation, we can't earn it, we don't deserve it, and it's going to have to be received as a gift. Number five, his only begotten son. We've got to dispute this one. And the objection here is the exclusivity of the message. His only begotten son that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so people say, well, wait a minute. What about sincere Hindus and Muslims and Buddhists? What about them? Well, what about them? The great news is that God loves Hindus and Buddhists and Muslims too. He loves atheists. He loves everyone. And he wants to save everyone. But if you're a sincere Muslim or a sincere Buddhist or Hindu, if you follow that path, you'll come to a dead end because none of these religions offer a savior. And when you discover that you can't fix yourself, no matter how hard you try, and that you need salvation, you need someone to do this for you, none of those religions offer a savior. And if you go looking for a savior, you'll find out the list is very short. There's just one, and that's the son. So his only son, this is the offer that God makes to us, that he's willing to give his only son. So any sincere Hindu or Buddhist or Muslim or atheist, when they seriously search for the answers to life, they will come to Jesus because he is the way, the truth, and the life, and the only one who can bring us to God. Then number six, that whoever... Uh, opposed to that one. I've heard people say this, are you telling me that my little granny, who never heard a flea, she hasn't prayed this little prayer that you're supposed to pray in order to become a Christian, and so she's going to go to hell, but some mass murderer who on his last day before he's executed, he prays this little prayer to Jesus, and so now he gets into heaven, and all those sins just disappear. Is that, is that what you're saying? some get out of hell free card. He says, I, I strenuously object to that. Well, you know, I would never say that praying a little prayer does away with all those sins. No, what Jesus did on the cross does away with those sins. And if you're trusting in Jesus, then he saves you from your sins. And if you're trusting anything else, there's nothing else that can save you. So the idea that whoever can be saved you know, this was the objection of the other brother in the story of the prodigal son. Is this any way to treat a prodigal? To throw a party when he comes home from the far country? But that's exactly the point Jesus was making. These Pharisees objected to this idea. What is Jesus doing hanging around with all these sinners? And Jesus said, now, gentlemen, if you saw a doctor hanging around with sick people, what would you say? What's he doing hanging around with those sick people? Doesn't he know they're sick? Well, yes. Jesus said, I didn't come to call good people. I came to call sinners to repentance. And so when he says whoever, he means whoever, including the thief hanging on the cross who couldn't join a church, couldn't get baptized, couldn't give tithes, couldn't do anything except look away from his sin and look to Jesus. And Jesus said, on the basis of that, you'll be with me in paradise. It's not your prayer. It's not the amount of your faith. It's not your behavior. It's Jesus alone who can save. And because it's based on Jesus alone, he can make that offer to anyone. A poor, uneducated, blind beggar lying in the streets of Calcutta can come to Jesus just as much as a religious person sitting in a church pew because he's as close as a prayer. He's available to everyone. The gospel is to whosoever. Number seven, believes on him. We've got to argue about that one too. People do all the time. They say, 
there's got to be something more to this. That's way too easy. They stumble at the simplicity of the gospel. But as I say, in order to make it available to a blind beggar or a thief on a cross, God had to provide a salvation that would be based on something that everybody could do. I am not one of those who believes that God only gives faith to certain people. No, the Bible says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Anyone who hears the Word of God can respond positively to what God says. And that's what repentance is, changing my mind so that no longer do I try and excuse my sin or suggest that I can improve my own state I agree with God about the sin, and I agree with God about the solution, and I turn from my sin to Christ. So, to believe on him, it may seem to be simple, but it's not easy, right? If I offend someone, the Bible says, go and tell them you're sorry. That's simple, but it's not easy, because my pride's involved. Nonetheless, when God gives us the gospel, he gives it to us in a way that everyone can understand. In fact, he says, unless you become like a little child, you can't enter in. There's an act of simple faith in what God says, to believe on him. Now, I don't have to understand light or electricity or digestion in order to benefit from enjoying the light or using the electricity or eating a good meal. There's a very complicated system that runs the universe, but to enjoy it is a very simple thing. So to understand the gospel, if people say the gospel's too simple, I say, well, then you explain Romans and Hebrews to me. The mechanics of it is very complicated, but the enjoyment of it is very simple. I don't have to understand how a computer works to plug it in and use it. And I don't have to understand all the background to the gospel if I put my simple faith in Christ, God saves me. Number eight should not perish. Well, I'd certainly debate that. <laughs> people will, first of all, on the basis they say, I don't believe that a loving God would even send people to hell. They reject the notion of hell. Well, we understand that hell was not created for sinners. It was created for the devil and his angels. But if people side with the devil against God and refuse God's only way of salvation, God says you're welcome to it. He doesn't send people to hell. People are going to hell, and he's in the business of saving them from going to hell. But if people insist on going, he lets them have their own way. So others doubt that they're as bad as that. They say, well, I don't think I'm bad enough for hell. They're not sure they're good enough for heaven, but they don't exactly know where they fit in. What do you have to do to go to hell? Nothing. Just carry on. You're already under the wrath of God. You're already under condemnation. We're born sinners. We're born damaged goods. Now we're worse than we have to be. We actually go looking for sin. And God warns us that if we don't turn from our sin, we will perish with the enemy. But yes, perishing is a real possibility. The word to perish actually doesn't mean to go to hell. It means to be a waste, to be useless to never fulfill the purpose for which God created you. And God wants to make something of us. He designed us for a purpose. And until we're willing to trust him, we'll never discover what that is. Number nine, but have. <laughs> well, let's lock horns on that one. Right. Uh, some call this the unpardonable sin. They say, you can't know you're saved. And they object to this idea. And when I say, I know I'm saved, they think, oh, he really thinks he's something. He must have massive warehouses full of good works that he's a shoe into heaven. But that's not what we're saying. To have eternal life is a gift from God. It's not a performance. It's not my behavior that gives it to me. It's Christ's finished work at the cross. And so to say, I have, it's not the height of presumption to say, I have it. It's the height of presumption to say you can't know that you have it when God says you can. And John records for us in his first epistle, these things are written that you might know that you have eternal life, 1 John 5, 13. So God says you can know, 
And if you say, well, I put my trust in Christ, but I'm not sure, who's making the mistake? Not God. You're making the mistake. You need to just trust what God says. And here the scripture says, you have eternal life. So he that has the Son has life and shall not come into judgment, but is already passed from death unto life. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. These are glorious truths. We need to just take what God says at his word. And number 10, everlasting life. Let's quarrel about that one. <laughs> All right. Um, they say, well, you know, it must be possible to lose it. If not, then you'd live like the devil. If God can't hold this over you, threatening you, that if you don't behave properly, that he's going to take eternal life away from you. But, you know, Christianity is not a ritual, a religion. It's not rule keeping. It's a relationship. It's life in Christ. And my eternal life, my everlasting life, is not a something he gives me. He gives me himself. Christ is our life. And so I'm secure because my life is secure in him. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, we will appear with him in glory. So God doesn't give me life and say, here, let's see what you can do with it. He gives me Christ, and Christ secures my life. The gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. So Christ is my life. He secures it. He says, I give to my sheep eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone pluck them out of my hand. So my security is not based on me. If at any point salvation rests on me, that's where the whole thing falls apart. But as Jonah said, salvation is of the Lord, start to finish. He's the one who saves me. He's the one who secures me. And he guarantees me safe passage all the way home to heaven. Not based on my performance, but based on Christ's finished and perfect work at Calvary. Well, I don't think anyone's going to read John 3.16 quite the same after this. <laughs> Isn't it astounding how people can stumble at the word and can find all sorts of reasons not to simply enjoy what God says? Joy and peace in believing. And as I tell to people who come and argue with me, you can have your arguments or you can have peace. You can have your arguments or you can have satisfaction in Christ. I would prefer to have the assurance based on what God says. You won't know it's true until it happens to you. But once you put your trust in Christ, you find out that what God says is true after all.